we're going to go through some main topic questions, and then I'll be going down into the audience and uh, picking up questions for the panel. Anything that you might have, I'll be running down. So, first question for each of you. How did you get started with bringing Elixir onto your projects? Uh, and did you do that first by getting a bunch of buy-in from the team, or did you do prototypes, proof of concepts on your own? Brandon? Uh, sure. Uh, so the way that we started uh, bringing Elixir into our organization was uh, at the level of getting buy-in. So starting off, you really need to, like, you can't just be the only person at your organization trying to say, like, hey, let's go use this new thing, because it kind of looks like you're uh, trying to chase down a fad, or, um, you know, you can get that kind of immediate gut reaction uh, to that. So we actually started through um, just kind of introducing Elixir and some of the like little nice aspects of the language or the VM that it sits on um, to uh, basically get more people interested so that when we wanted to make our case for it, we, have, we had kind of a unified front uh, to be able to make that case. Yeah, and in uh, my case it was very similar. We uh, approach the problem from uh, the point of we're going to need to rewrite this tech stack. That was the, the first agreement that we all reached. It was like, things have gotten too complicated. We can't just iterate on this. It's best to, to tear out chunks and start anew. And once we agreed on that and we were on a PHP stack, the question got opened up of like, oh, are we open to just doing it in a different language if we're less comfortable working in PHP than in something else, and uh, that's how the uh, Elixir question got brought up, and that's how Elixir got, in my case, compared to a couple of other languages in terms of what would be most suitable for the organization. Uh, what did your first prototypes look like when you were, when you were getting that started after buy-in? Uh, yeah, we started off with a auto-suggest uh, prototype, which is the uh, automatic completion on the search widget, which is on every page of our website. And I think that was a really important move for us uh, for a couple of reasons. We, it's, A, it was like a real part of the application. It's, it gets live production data. It, it's like a fully fleshed out part of the ecosystem. And B, none of our internal systems depend on it. Like users like interact with it directly, so it gets real traffic, but there's no dependencies, there's no like, weird other like failure cascades that we could cause with uh, picking uh, auto-suggest. So that's like what made it an ideal candidate for us to try it out. Um, in our case, we had an API uh, that was dealing with uh, basically large sets of data um, that our customers were requesting. So we had essentially a uh, set of test cases that we, we wanted to verify that like it, any request coming into this one particular endpoint, it actually should be transparent uh, to those users, whether or not it's getting routed to our uh, Ruby application or our Elixir application. The nice thing about that is through automated testing and a couple of other tricks, we were actually able to uh, verify that the results were going to be identical in almost every scenario, which allowed us to just slowly introduce just a single endpoint only written in um, Elixir and Phoenix that was actually routing uh, traffic at you know small percentages at first, but we kept ramping those numbers up to see like, okay, is this gonna introduce new errors, uh, new scenarios that we have to handle, and over time we built that, just that one endpoint up to a 100% replacement from our uh, Ruby stack into our Phoenix stack. And the users, no one had any idea that anything had changed other than their responses were suddenly getting served back a lot faster. So how do you make the pitch when you're going for the buy-in? How do you make that pitch to other developers coming from different backgrounds who have no idea what Elixir is? Because often they, they don't. Uh, and is that different? And how is that different when you're pitching to non Developers, if you're pitching to management, if you're pitching to you know somebody who has authority but isn't necessarily working with the code. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I want to start with the pitching to management part of it. Uh, that's very, I think, dependent on what your individual organization structure is and kind of how it works. If 
if your Elixir technolo technology decision makes sense on the back end has a lot to do with like how much like kind of trust and good faith there's been built up in engineering to be able to like make that decision uh, in how much space you're you've got to uh, to, to just like navigate without getting it too much into the, the nitty gritty details and also with like how you're able to explain or how much risk mitigation you need to be able to explain to managers saying like oh well yeah maybe Elixir is like a really new, new language so that's a risky proposition but it's built on the Erlang framework and that's been around for well, I don't know how many years now 30 something 40 something uh, yeah, so I think those are like the compelling arguments upwards. Uh, to developers, it's, well, my my winning argument is just, I joined the company. I didn't know anything about Elixir other than it worked with Erlang. And uh, now I'm here. So. Um, so from the developer perspective, uh, we actually, uh, one way that we uh, found work actually very well was doing um, lunch and learns. So our company was already ha already had a concept of uh, brown bags and uh, lunch and learns and things like that where you would just present on something. It might be related to something in your main tech stack or it might be uh, something just radically different. Uh, you know, we've done things on GraphQL but didn't actually have any GraphQL in our code base. Um, so it was already kind of a nice opportunity to say like, hey, I'm just going to show this here. And if you like what you see, you know, maybe, maybe reach out to me. Maybe we'll talk about some uh, side projects that we could explore. Um, and over time, developers kind of naturally see the value of being able to avoid immutability. And, you know, working with the, the pipeline operator is basically everyone's favorite feature when they first start off is like, Oh, okay, I could just write it like this. this is great. I, yes, I want to do this everywhere, which is why you know there's proposals for a pipe operator in JavaScript now, proposals for a pipe operator in Ruby, and I'm sure like everything is trying to do it uh, now. Um, but then from the manager perspective, now that you've kind of got developers excited about something and you want to do that, um, is anyone in here uh, had to do a lot of uh, communications with upper management? Uh, sorry. Uh, What's up? We have okay, yeah. Um, and you have to use graphs. Uh, Elixir and Phoenix lend themselves very nicely to graphs, uh, whether it's up and to the right for you know uh, how many requests you can serve at the same time, or if it's uh, your cost graphs where things are going down because maintenance is easier, scalability is easier, a lot of things are handled in a nice way. So both of you, we, we talked about where you started, uh, and obviously Elixir's grown on all those projects. Uh, were there specific problems or pain points that you guys encountered, that your teams encountered, as you're going from, oh, it's the side project that we're starting on, to you know, taking over 100% of the API or things like that? Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, I would say something probably a lot of people are in here have run into. Uh, Configuration and deployment were uh, kind of the two major ones. So uh, just, okay, we got this into production. We want to use uh, environment variables to set different configurations like uh, uh, the pool timeout in Poolboy, which was especially a headache for us of trying to figure out, okay, well, this is an Erlang library that we need to configure. We need to configure it at runtime. Um, but we're not recompiling this every single time we want to do a deploy. So how do we manage that? Like, we want to be able to change these variables on the fly. Um, that was, I think, probably one of the biggest things we ran into. And it wasn't a blocker. It didn't stop us. But it definitely was a little bit of a headache for a while. Yeah, for us, we had similar issues, uh, which we had a, a convenient solution to, which is uh, we had built out a deployment framework for uh, the front end migration part of our work, which we migrated from PHP front end to Node. And we were using Kubernetes for that, and the ops, work, ops team had to put in a lot of work into building that out, so that was kind of our solution to uh, the deployment issue. But we, a couple of the pain points that like remained, and we still have some questions about are, how do we manage Elixir releases versus, or like Erlang application releases versus the Dockerized approach? 
Like, how do we balance that? Because we don't need slash can't use a lot of the, the power of like the Erlang, like uptime guarantees and the, the distributed Erlang systems when we're in this Dockerized world. Uh, another is the, uh, oh, totally blanking. Uh, the, the, t the time when you move from a like big chunky application to the umbrella app structure, that's kind of what we're wrestling with right now. We've got this like large, relatively complicated API backend and we're evaluating like what's the right move there and like how does the umbrella app uh, model mesh with um, what we're trying to do. All right, do we have questions uh, about uh, adopting Elixir, Elixir, getting Elixir on team from anybody outside right now? Mm -hmm. Cylinder, you mentioned uh, you, know, uh, you had some limitations because you were using it in a Dockerized uh, Yeah, the question is just, uh, you mentioned that there are some limitations when you deployed on a Docker architecture, and I'm just curious about what the nature of those limitations are. Yeah, so uh, Elixir is, or sorry, Erlang, rather, is very opinionated on it's how nodes should be communicating with each other in the distributed Erlang model. And it wants you to, to have these nodes that are, like, to manage the connections through the, the like node supervisor model. And with Kubernetes, really it's the, like the, the Kubernetes supervisor, or not supervisor, but the Kubernetes uh, pod manager and scaler is taking care of that aspect of it. So it's been tough for us to find, like sometimes there's a, a problem that we see, uh, oh, we, we wanna be able to broadcast this message to all of our nodes. Uh, we don't have, the distributed Erlang system set up, it doesn't really make sense for it to be set up given that we've got the Kubernetes architecture, so now we're bringing in the third technology component to manage that broadcast as opposed to just keeping it entirely in Erlang. Any other questions? What is the, oh, sorry, was there somebody? Hi, so you guys mentioned upper management and I'm sort of a mole in upper management here, but I, I came from uh, lots of engineering backgrounds, so I'm actually one of the people in the company that is trying to push this forward. Um, one of the things that I find challenging is that uh, when you guys talk about stuff like, um, it's easy to show like the nice graphs of response times or number of requests per second. Um, a lot of stuff that I hear in the community is like, we went to Elixir because it was way faster than Ruby, right, or Rails. And it's really easy to, to talk about that comparison. Um, I come from a giant company that we use lots of other things that are not slow um, or not implicitly pretty slow. So it's, for me, it's harder to make the, uh, the, the same sort of comparison to something like Java or Golang or .NET Core or something like that, which perform pretty well. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on you know, trying to convince people like me about how fast Phoenix is when there's lots of other things out there that are pretty fast. Yeah, um, so if I were, if I'm evaluating against something that uh, kind of has like a stigma attached to it of you know, how are you going to scale this application after a certain amount of time, that becomes kind of an easy comparison point when it's something that is a much more established technology, like if you're sitting on top of an entire uh, Java stack that has been incredibly optimized and you've really gotten that performance tuned down, um, that actually may not be where I would focus my, intent, my attention because there are other significant benefits. Um, the biggest one in my mind is having that guarantee of immutability and how that affects how much time uh, developers, and I apologize because I'm kind of putting on my manager hat here, um, but how much time developers are spending working on fixing issues that get introduced and how much of that time uh, pops up, how much of that impacts customer uh, experience or stakeholder experience, and what kind of like long-term costs that that actually introduces. 
versus something where I can actually make some level of guarantees, whether it's through what the compiler gives me or what the benefits of an immutable uh, architecture gives me or what the benefits of a functional architecture <laughs> gives me in terms of you know, how much time are my developers spending just working on code and adding value and doing better things for our company versus trying to trace down some really weird locking issue or race condition that we have no way uh, really to like dive into without taking you know at least one senior resource, probably multiple non-senior resources and people like just dedicating themselves for, uh, in, I've had an experience where it took uh, two months just to track down one race condition. That's a lot of lost time, that's a lot of lost effort. And it's also a big uh, missed opportunity for things we could have been doing to add value to the company. So that cost is actually like double what it is. Uh, yeah, I've got a very similar answer, I think. Uh, just the, if you, so yeah, the context is super important. If you're, you're gonna have to go into this assuming that you're coming from a place of many architectures, because if you're, if you're already using one general purpose language, C++ or, or Java or Go or whatever, um, or even two, like maybe you have Python for a lot of your data science stuff or analytics or something, or, uh, or Scala or something, uh, then maybe it doesn't make sense to, to use Elixir. I think the killer feature is, yeah, the concurrency model is, it's done, it's solved for you, it's baked into the language, it's in everything that's in the language. You don't need to debug it. Um, there's, a, it takes a while maybe to learn the idiomatic way of, of doing things right in Elixir, so that is a, that's a, an educational cost to your company, to your developers. Um, but yeah, historically, uh, in the many years I had before I was working with Elixir, the hardest problems to debug are the, the pthread gone wild, or why am I never entering or always in this critical section? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so just, yeah, that, like, that itself has been great. I think there's another benefit, too, of uh, it's simple. Uh, not to say that it's easy, but it is simple. Sometimes it's so simple, it's, it's hard to, like, uh, to, to figure out how you get to do what, or how you can do what you need to do with it. Um, but it's a great, like, learning tool, I think, uh, I've been very surprised with how quickly a lot of the junior engineers at the organization have picked up Elixir and um, are just like rolling with it and like really learning these, uh, like the actor model kind of intuitively. Uh, right. oh, I, I, I just I, one very quick right. anecdote. Um, we actually had an Elixir app that was running in production that we actually forgot about because nobody had to maintain it. It was doing exactly what it needed to do and it was never exceeding like 1% CPU. So we literally forgot that it was running in production until we had that database go down for maintenance and started seeing a bunch of error messages pop up in our uh, log aggregator. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Shanti and Brandon. Uh, that's the end of this panel and we'll move on to deployment. <laughs>